Hi, my name is Camila and welcome to the Humans of AI interviews, where together with my guests from academia and business, we try to demystify what AI is and what is not. Hopefully making this whole concept a bit more approachable and digestible. Today, we are welcoming Lord Clement Jones. Tim is a liberal Democrat peer and their spokesman for the digital economy in the House of Lords. He is also a former spokesman on creative industries. Tim is also chair of Council of Queen Mary University of London and chair of the advisory council of the Institute for uh, Ethical AI in Education, led by Sir Anthony Seldon. Without further ado, let's start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, Tim. Thank you for being here. Pleasure. Very nice to be with you, Camilla. <laughs> Thank you. So let's kick off. Uh, so I know that your mantra is change starts with ideas and is achieved by actions. You are bridging the worlds of government and the private sector working together on advancing in uh, technology. And you are a, a House of Lords liberal Democrat spokesman uh, for digital, uh, among many other exciting uh, roles you hold and uh, making the difference in the UK, uh, UK's economy. How did your journey uh, look like to where you are right now? Well, it's very interesting because it came through the creative industries. I was the spokesperson for uh, the uh, DCMS department in my party mm -hmm. um, uh, in 2004 uh, and then through into the coalition. Um, and uh, of course, the creative industries have been transformed by digital, particularly music in yes. that period of time. So really it was a kind of sideways move um, as the tech industries and digital became more important um, in UK life. And uh, in about 2016, 17, I thought to myself, well, actually the coming technology is artificial intelligence and I better, you know, uh, get up to speed yeah, on this. Yeah. And then I realized that nobody else in Parliament understood what was happening with artificial mm -hmm. intelligence either. And therefore, I founded the all-party parliamentary group on artificial intelligence. I was then asked to chair the House of Lords Select Committee. And so it's continued since then, basically, that, you know, artificial intelligence has sort of taken over my life, really. Um, but it is, you know, um, it's a natural progression because, let's face it, the world has gone completely digital in the last 20 years. Uh, we've seen that with COVID. Um, you know, we've seen that with all the plans now being put together in Europe, uh, so-called digital sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the UK wants to be the centre, you know, and have a, a brilliant digital economy as well. So mm -hmm. this is you know, very much the, uh, the issue of our times. Yes, yes. Such an amazing journey you have. The, the, the power of artificial intelligence, as you said, um, creates a lot of opportunities and the risks uh, that public policy uh, must eventually address. Uh, so you once said the government has to make sure that uh, our AI strategy is carried forward in a very coordinated way. Uh, so in terms of those concerns, uh, do you think there is a place for heavy regulation of AI? Why do you think governments should uh, step in and regula regulate AI? Why can't uh, the industry themselves, like itself, uh, regulate? Uh, re yeah, well, that's a, very, that's a very good question. I mean, the fact is that uh, regulation should only be put into place where it's needed. And mm -hmm. what you need is a way of deciding mm -hmm. how and when uh, regulation is appropriate basically. I'm not a, a great regulator myself and our House of Lords Select Committee report did not say we need you to regulate AI and have new regulators and all this kind of stuff but what we need is an approach which says now what is the risk of new technologies you know where do and in particular sectors in particular use cases uh, you know what are the risks involved and what is appropriate is it voluntary codes is it corporate governance for instance mm -hmm. corporate standards which are put into effect uh, or do you have to go the whole hog and have regulation and there are certain sorts of technology like uh, facial recognition like a, a, a algorithmic decision making for instance in certain sectors like financial services where probably 
we need to sort of set up a, a, a regulatory system, but it has to be risk-based. And of course, what is so interesting is that is the current agenda too. The European Union white paper last year, uh, Center for Data Ethics and Innovation this year, we've all started talking about how we evaluate uh, when to regulate on a risk basis. Mm -hmm. And how do you facilitate this conversation for UK's government? Well, uh, that's what the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation is all about, basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have dialogue with them in Parliament. Uh, they're very much part of the kind of artificial intelligence scene, basically. And, of mm -hmm. course, you talked earlier of what I said about coordination. Well, mm -hmm. of course, the really important thing is to make sure that as between the various institutions, mm -hmm. you know, like our Office for AI, like the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, like our information commissioner, uh, like the Alan Turing Institute, you know, and all the other players, you know, um, on the outside um, in Parliament and in institutions like Ada Lovelace, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. that we all march together in some kind of coordinated way. And that mm -hmm. applies to, you know, the kind of research and development agenda. Uh, and it applies to the way we develop the ethics around uh, the application of artificial intelligence. So you do need this kind of strategic approach. And um, we had a, a very good strategy. We had an industrial strategy. Um, we had the, uh, the uh, deal, if you like, the sector deal for artificial intelligence. But of course, we've slightly lost sight of some of those things because of COVID. And I hope that, you know, uh, as things go uh, back to some kind of normality, that we then reappraise where we are uh, with AI and our strategy, and we kind of pull it all back together again. I mean, which is exactly what the European Union is doing, of course, as well, with the new uh, presidency plan and so on and so forth. Great. Thank you. And I know that you're a big um, advocate of ethical um, AI. So why do you think talking um, and putting a lot of uh, focus on, on talking about uh, ethics um, is, is very important? Well, I think there's always been the question of, uh, you know, ethics in the application of new technology. Yeah. But I think it's given particular purpose because AI, yes, it is a tool, but it's also it also has the power of autonomy, if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be that AI, if allowed to develop in a particular way, becomes so autonomous that it doesn't actually embed uh, ethical values. And I think we need to make sure, and I always use this phrase, that artificial intelligence need to be our servant, not our master. So what you have to do is actually add values into the application of AI. And that means making sure that it's free of bias, that it isn't a black box, uh, that it is for human benefit, that there is a human in the loop, uh, that the human-centered AI, to use that expression, um, is very much part of the ethos and so on. And there are, you know, other aspects about accountability and so on um, that, you know, one could uh, go into. But, you know, by and large, there are certain principles that need to be embedded uh, into it when we actually uh, adopt uh, artificial intelligence. And that, of course, is very commonly accepted now. You know, let's face it, we've almost got too many codes of ethics. We've got, you know, the overarching ones for the OECD and the EU and uh, G20 and so on. But we've also got the partnership on AI principles. We've got, you know, uh, uh, so many, the Asiloma principles, we've got so many um, that actually what we really need to do is just refine the thinking and say, right, these are the basics. And, mm -hmm. you know, is it appropriate? Uh, will they be complied with? Or do we need to go further in corporate governance or in regulation to make sure that uh, AI is truly ethical when it's applied? Mm -hmm. And expanding on the bias, uh, as you said, it's, it's uh, biased by our, ourselves, right? Because we trained uh, the machines uh, taking the real, real uh, world observations, real world uh, data. And we as humans are biased. So we encode human prejudice, <laughs> wrong decisions, uh, and all goes to our algorithms. So what do you think, um, or like, what can we make, what can we do to make sure that we don't, then, then <laughs> we don't discriminate against anyone? 
Well, you know, that's, that's a huge question. And of course, what is bias? And people like Kate Crawford in the States and so on, you know, have uh, written extensively about the difficulty of identifying what really is bias, because yes. one person's bias might be another person's sure. uh, discrimination or uh, for the right reasons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of making bias. sure that people get a fair crack of the whip or whatever. Yeah. But by and large, we have to have the tools which uh, allow us to assess whether the data that is used for training uh, of artificial intelligence systems and so on is actually biased and then to see whether the outcome is as well. Now, we don't really yet have all the tools we need in that respect, uh, mm -hmm. but we need to be very conscious. And one of the key issues in assessing bias is the diversity of our workforce, particularly those who work in tech. Mm -hmm. And if, because if you are, uh, don't have sufficient diversity, then you don't have people who pick up on the uh, bias issues. So, you know, that's a really, that's a really important aspect. But at the moment, I think it's, you know, it's important that people are sensitized to the fact that there may be bias. And I'm a great optimist. I mean, I believe that actually, if we get it right, AI can be less biased than yeah. human beings. Exactly, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of point you're making. Um, if we can get the systems right and we can get the right uh, tools, if you like, to assess whether there is inherent bias uh, in the data or in the system that we're building, then I think that's going to be a, a lot better way of making decisions. I still think you need humans in the loop, mm -hmm. but the fact that you've got a tool which is unbiased uh, could be something really powerful. But we're not there yet because we don't, frankly, yet have the audit tools uh, and the impact assessment tools that we really need. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's, it's very important to, to have this um, open like, tr transparency of data to, to know exactly what kind of information goes into and that the data is, is diverse. Yes, and that's why if you like, the bias aspect is so closely linked to the uh, transparency and explainability aspects mm -hmm. too. And, you know, uh, the, there are less and less excuses for black boxes nowadays. If you design in advance, you know, and there could people talk about the trade-off between, you know, accuracy and, and transparency. Well, I think if you do uh, what's described by the IEEE as uh, ethically aligned design, you know, right up front, then I think you can uh, uh, actually square the circle on those things. But, uh, you know, we've had that debate, really. And I think now uh, the time has come for people to accept the fact that explainability is inherently practical and possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and with everything as powerful as AI can be, uh, and it can be used for good, but it can also be uh, misused, as you said. And there are some companies which uh, invigilate uh, employees at work and take screenshots, for example, every 30 seconds to see if the employee is working, if they are engaged. Um, or the famous case with um, Cambridge Analytica, which I know that you've uh, discussed as well on one of the webinar. So what do you think can be done to prevent companies from abusing uh, power of AI? Well, that's a classic example of where you calibrate the risk. And you say to yourself, OK, uh, people should know uh, that there are sets of, of ethical principles to be applied when you're um, putting in AI, let alone things like GDPR, you know, data protection issues, uh, but, you know, and biometric uh, use and so on and so forth. But um, uh, if companies are seen not to comply, then you know, you say to yourself, right, well, what we need is a binding set of corporate standards. We put those into effect. If people don't comply with those uh, over a period, well, we see whether or not we need full scale regulation. So we actually say you cannot use these technologies unless you conform to these particular standards, you know, that there is awareness of the use, that there is consent, uh, that they're only for a particular purpose and so on. So I'm a great a person for tightening up depending on compliance basically mm -hmm. and depending on how well people behave i wouldn't plunge in straight away um uh, and of course you know uh, by and large most hr professionals know you know uh, uh how they're meant to behave and so on mm -hmm. and therefore it's going to be a few outliers now the question is how do you deal with the outliers and do you need to regulate the whole sector in order to get at the people who are not conforming? You know, I mean, uh, there are all kinds of issues involved in that. But, you know, we may need some kind of new legislation eventually. 
um, if, if people don't uh, recognize that they can't just install these kinds of technologies um, without making sure that they're ethically used. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's making people aware that uh, they are being... Uh, yeah, completely. ...tied on, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the angle of transpar transparency of data. Uh, so China treats uh, transparency and data privacy very differently to what we see in the European Union. Uh, so what you just said, um, the, the famous GDPR. So given the differences between access to information regimes from country to country, uh, what do you think can be done to provide a fair access and, and transparency of data? I know that you um, you are a spokesman for on, on like UK's economy, but you are very closely working with like Chinese and uh, Middle Eastern uh, organizations as well. So, how what do you see? Um, how how do you think we can uh, achieve uh, like a fair fair transparency and and the open communication? Let's say. Between... Well, of course, I mean everybody's ambition, including my own is to have a, a set of principles worldwide that are commonly adopted. And I think, you know, I think there's um, reasonable evidence that in terms of people like uh, the UAE, for instance, in the Middle East, uh, and probably Saudi, that they accept those uh, overarching principles. Beijing um, set out some Beijing principles last year. Um, uh, and then signed up to the G20 principles. So, in you know, actually, uh, in theory, uh, everybody should be signing up. The question is how people actually, uh, governments behave in their own countries. Now, so there's a difference between, if you like, commercial application mm -hmm. and between government application. And so that's where I think the issues lie. But you can't judge a country, you know, I mean, obviously, we've all got human rights issues, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that we want to raise. But um, uh, what we can't do is legislate for other countries' behaviour. What we can do is make sure when we procure off private companies that their behaviour uh, uh, is in accordance with uh, international standards, human rights and ethical principles of AI. And that's really what I think we should focus on, quite honestly. Um, uh, and I think that's a very important agenda item, quite honestly. Um, you know, we want to see proper behavior by uh, global companies. And, you know, let's face it, uh, uh, at the moment, there's a lot of uh, anger about Facebook and hate, hate speech and boycotts by advertisers and so on. So it, it, these big companies are not immune um, from, if you like, global public opinion, which is, I think, very, very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's talk a, uh, a bit more about potential of, for, for economic uh, of, uh, and job uh, market disruption. Uh, so I personally think that uh, AI will create many more uh, jobs uh, than it's, it's, uh, it's going to erase. But do you think it will be as destructive uh, on the scale of like new industrial revolution? Do you think it's going to be better for the economy or like people will have problem with adjusting to to new job market situation uh, my answer to that is it very much depends on government action i mean and employer action because one of the key key things that covid has highlighted is the need for digital skills is the need for people to scale up their own skill set um, and that's really important. And at the moment, um, you know, I don't think we've done nearly enough. Uh, we did. We weren't doing enough before COVID and we haven't given any indication that we're doing enough now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that's the agenda of the future, especially given the uh, amount of unemployment and so on that we're going to be seeing and where jobs in hospitality and uh, so on are going to be lost. You know, digital skills and the ability to work digitally uh, uh, is going to be so important. And it's really, really been highlighted uh, for the future. I do think, you know, uh, when I was looking at this two years ago, um, that there is going to be major disruption in the job market. I was um, sort of relatively neutral as to whether or not this was going to be 
uh, there's going to be on balance more jobs created than jobs mm -hmm. lost. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't one of the doom mongers, which was the sort of Osborne Frey agenda that, you know, 45% of jobs are automatable and all this kind of thing. But I, you know, I, I did do think that whatever the scale that takes place, it is absolutely up to government and major employers to make sure that uh, uh, we upskill and reskill so that, you know, people in their 40s and 50s, uh, uh, are able to reinvent themselves, that mm -hmm. young people can do conversion courses, mm -hmm. you know, from the humanities, uh, and then have a, a sort of creative use of technology because they understand the technology. I'm, I'm not a STEM, 100% STEM person at all. That's a very big mistake that we're making if we're just saying it's all about the STEM skills. The mm -hmm. STEAM, the, the arts and the creative skills, mm -hmm are extremely important because we need to be creative in the way that we use technology in mm -hmm. the future. So it's a very big agenda. And I don't think we've come anywhere near uh, grabbing the agenda, unlike places like Finland, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, uh, some great schemes. Um, we need to learn from other countries, quite honestly. Yeah, and I really like the point uh, you, get, you made on importance of um, giving people skills of uh, or like letting them focus on expanding their skills on cre like creative skills right because that's one of the very difficult things to automate right so um, there will be lots of jobs will be which will be done by robots but creating uh, cre creative uh, jobs are the ones which are probably the <laughs> main yeah. Absolutely. Those are the human skills, creativity and so on. And what have we seen at a premium during COVID? I mean, you know, we've seen stand up comedians, we've seen artists. I mean, one of the great series has been seeing great Grayson Perry uh, with his series, you know. Uh, wonderful series during COVID, um, mm -hmm. encouraging people to, uh, you know, uh, produce artworks and so yeah. on. I mean, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's been mirrored in many, many other ways. Um, uh, people doing haikus, um, you know, thousands of people taking part in uh, uh, writing haikus all about their lockdown experience, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is part of our human experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got to remember that, you know, uh, AI is an adjunct. It's augmenting what mm -hmm. we can do. It mustn't be as just treated as a substitution for what we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really, really like your point. So let's uh, talk about a bit of more on, on the emotional part. So when, do you think that when the majority of our jobs are going to be automated and we choose uh, how to work, what to work on, do you think it will have a big impact on people's uh, satisfaction and happiness? If we assume that the job is a road to happiness and, and, and satisfaction, do you think people will have trouble in finding or refinding the, um, the purpose and the meaning? Well, again, you have to be conditional about these things. I mean, you know, the question is if employers just simply use AI as a way of substituting for human uh, endeavor, human work, and they just simply uh, make people redundant and they put them on the scrap heap and they don't reskill them. Well, that's one scenario. Another scenario is where people introduce artificial intelligence to get rid of the grunt work, so to speak, to get rid of the boring bits of the work, but so that humans can then creatively use it uh, for all kinds of different uh, ways of analyzing uh, data, improving uh, uh, decisions and so on. Now, you know, that's a big if. You don't know how people are going to uh, 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 apply artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be very conscious. And that's why when you, people in big companies and small companies uh, apply artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. they need to have their senior managers, their, their board effectively, uh, mm -hmm. really understanding what the application of AI and what its implications are. And that's why I'm a big fan of AI uh, impact assessments and so on at the highest level of companies and so that the board of a company is fully conscious of what the implications are. Mm -hmm. Yeah and as you see we've all seen uh, there is a dramatic shift of uh, jobs uh, when when the like the the new technology is coming out you see jobs which hadn't existed 10, 10 years ago, for example, the social media uh, roles. Where do you think um, 
the new types of jobs are going and how how can we help to to reskill the 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 people who are already on the market as you said like 40 50 years old uh, well that's a that's a really big uh, question mark but i always think that you know communication skills are going to be very important mm -hmm. um, and i think that those creative skills are going to be important in whatever sector you are i mean obviously you know i'm a great believer that uh, artificial intelligence could for instance deliver personalized education so you know people learn in very different ways artificial intelligence can a help identify that and b if you get it right and you deliver it in an ethical fashion you can tailor particular ways of educating and learning towards particular individuals depending on their skills depending on how they learn so i you know i'm a, i'm a believer in in that but you obviously have to be flexible you have to you know understand that there is no one size fits all and you have to have a, you know some understanding of how the technology works and so on so there's you know for instance the teaching profession has got a big big job in catching up in that respect in healthcare you know um uh, gps uh, specialists and so on um you know using artificial intelligence is going to be you know pretty much an everyday experience basically um mm -hmm. uh, but you know how they use the data uh, uh, and all that side of things, I think, is going to be very important. You know, you only have to look at smart cities, for instance. You know, mm -hmm. the interface between all those different technologies, blockchain, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, the cloud, you know, these are big, big things. And uh, we need to uh, understand that, that they have big implications, you know, both in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, jobs, uh, uh, but in terms of quality of life, it could be a game changer, for instance, you know. And so uh, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I think we have to be, you know, very well aware of the framework in which we're putting all these technologies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've heard of the concept of the universal uh, basic income, right? So yes. how do you think we can make sure that everybody's enjoying the, the fruits of this uh, progress? Well, this is one of the big issues because distributive justice is, you know, the goal that we all have, basically. I, mean, I wouldn't be in politics unless I was, you know, very much uh, uh, in the side of politics that talks about uh, 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 social justice, that we talk about social mobility uh, and so on. Now, uh, there are a lot of advocates for universal basic income. I uh, do not necessarily think at this present moment that it is either needed or desirable. I think that there may be, coming down the track, other forms of support, such as what's called conditional um, basic uh, income. It's put forward in, in Jamie Suskin's um, book, The Future of Work, as a much better alternative, in my view, than universal basic income, because it basically says, look, if you can work, you should. And if you can do this, you know, a voluntary work or other forms of employment, even if you don't get paid, that's the basis on which we will support you because you must make a contribution to society. I don't want to see a society where we have some people, you know, at the top of the tree who've got fantastic jobs, um, who are extremely well paid and all the rest effectively are paid to stay at home and they're on the scrap heap. That is completely wrong. You know, we've got to basically value everybody's contribution in society. And if we can uh, do that, then I think we'll have a much healthier uh, society. We've seen now under COVID, you know, there are lots and lots of people out there who hadn't really understood the value of our NHS workers, our care workers, the people who, uh, who clear our refuse and so on. I mean, these are absolutely central to our society. And yet, you know, they're paid so, so little compared to some of the other players in our economy, you know. And so uh, COVID again, there's another lesson. There are many, many lessons I think people can learn from COVID. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and do you think, um, do you think that uh, we are, sorry, <laughs> I, I will cut it. <laughs> and do you know that, uh, you know that some countries are making uh, AI a strategic fo focus, for example, China. And um, do you think there is a race towards, uh, towards AI? And do you think uh, UK is a risk, uh, at the risk of falling behind or we are, do you think we are doing enough to be uh, innovating? 
I think I think we probably are. It's very interesting. I think it's very easy to get incredibly spooked by the sheer amount of money uh, uh, being invested in China, for instance. But, you know, um, there are some very good Chinese companies that are um, doing some of this. But if they um, if they want to uh, apply their products in the uh, world outside China, they're going to have to behave in an ethical fashion. I mean, we've seen the pressure on companies in entirely different fields like Huawei, for instance. Mm -hmm. The pressure on Alibaba and Tencent and so on and Baidu will be enormous. Uh, so they will feel the need to uh, behave ethically, develop ethical products and so on. Uh, and so by and large, you know, we're not, in, in, particularly in Europe, which has a very strong ethical agenda, and they now have a quite a strong investment agenda. Um, I, I think that uh, you know it will even out at the end of the day. Uh, we may not like how uh, certain forms of technology are used in individual countries, but if people are going to trade using AI systems and products, then they're going to have to conform to international standards, quite honestly. And that applies as much to US companies. We've seen the pressure on um, you know, people like uh, Facebook for the way that their algorithms work, for instance. Well, you know, that's exactly um, uh, the right point where we should be debating. You know, are those algorithms designed in such a way to direct us towards, you know, people who agree with us or are they giving us a, a full picture as to the debate going on? Well, that, that sort of debate, as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, is going to get greater and greater as time goes on. So that's why, you know, I'm actually an optimist about this. And I think that I'm pleased that in Europe we are setting setting standards. And increasingly, I mean, in California, for instance, they, you know, uh, people like Microsoft, they um, uh, uh, have accepted the GDPR as the gold standard. And you read somebody like Brad Smith's book, Tools and Weapons, he absolutely accepts the ethical agenda. So, you know, I think, you know, right across um, uh, Europe and America, we've, we've got that uh, 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 similarity. And I think that when we're talking about China, they in principle accept those rules. They just don't think that they apply um, to the state. You know, it's a different, it's a different philosophy, basically. Yeah, but I, I personally think like we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have so many great examples in, in the UK, uh, for example, the Deep, DeepMind, right? And the AlphaGo, uh, which is like a narrow AI, but it's still a, a great achievement uh, beating the human. You've, you've heard of this case. Yes, right? and y yes, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we're always wanting a better investment strategy and so on. But there's a limit to how much the state can do other than as a, as a kind of encourager. Mm. Um, and I, I'm pleased about the way the British Business Bank is going about its business. We've now got a new uh, research and development roadmap. Uh, we've now got new artificial intelligence procurement guidelines mm -hmm. by government. Um, you know, we've got a pretty powerful UKRI um, which determines the kind of uh, uh, research being done in our universities. So, I mean, you know, some people say that we're over centralized currently, that we're not allowing enough um, room to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. We're either um, being over strategic or or we're being under strategic. But mm -hmm. I think the moment we're just about getting it, getting it right. Yeah, um, yeah. But I would like to see, um, you know, in a sense, a greater uh, energy um, devoted um, towards AI, because I still think that there are a lot of companies out there that uh, are hesitant um, because they don't really understand the uh, opportunities available, you know. Yes, exactly. I completely agree with you. So, like, talking back, uh, back to, uh, coming back to what we discussed on the general, the, the cognitive uh, AI, uh, so, as, which is defined as a machine that has a, cap a capacity to understand or learn as humans do, right? So do you think uh, that this is like a far away future or this is something which will, will happen quite soon? Or do you, or, or you think it will never happen? Well, uh, you see, funny enough, I mean, I, I, I don't think it'll happen for quite some time. I mean, we're talking about artificial general intelligence mm -hmm. or what Nick Bostrom coined as super intelligence. But um, uh, quite frankly, it actually almost doesn't matter. 
you know, because the issues that are raised by the current levels of machine learning and so on are, are very great anyway, because there is a degree of autonomy, as I mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, which makes AI uh, particularly a matter of sort of public policy debate you know, in terms of the ethics and regulation and so on and so forth. Artificial general intelligence is a step further than that, but that raises even bigger problems. But if we don't solve the problems relating to narrow AI mm -hmm. uh, uh, at this point, then, uh, you know, we're never going to solve them for the larger issues that arise with AGI and super intelligence. So I would say we better get cracking now. Um, and then we might be in a position to cope with artificial general intelligence when it comes down the track in 10, 15, 20 years or whatever. I mean, it is, it is very um, uh, interesting. There are, you know, um, we've had many AI winters um, of one kind or another, and now we're going through a kind of peak of, of AI interest, although I sense that um, business in many respects is not as excited um, as it might have been a year ago or so. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think we've just got to keep our heads, basically, and make sure that we don't sort of suddenly get overexcited that the world is about to change so fundamentally um, uh, because there are still different sorts of AI being developed. You know, mm -hmm. many people say that machine learning has had its day, too much data. What we need is a less data-hungry type of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, fine. Well, uh, you know, that could be to our advantage in the UK uh, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of developments out there that are taking place, which, you know, quite frankly, um, uh, and, and, and unless you've got an extremely powerful crystal ball, um, I think you're going to find quite difficult, really. <laughs> so we discussed about the autonomous um, um, algorithms, but... Uh, or like the software in general, but uh, do you have any opinion on the autonomous uh, robots uh, and the application, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but the application in the military, for example, which is quite a contro controversial subject. How do you think we should look at it? Well, I, you know, bots are just another form of artificial intelligence. And I think that um, particularly customer facing um, bots if you like we need to know when they're used and when they're not there need to be standards there need to be kite marking but you know at the end of the day it could massively improve customer service it could help those delivering customer service um uh, to quite a large extent so you know i think that that sort of um uh, area um, does have uh, does have promise um but you know you i think you have to assess you know every form of AI and defense is no exception. You know, I mean, for a period, we were saying that in order to be regulatable, our defense use of AI had to have weapons that were um, uh, uh, new, had intention, you know, i.e. they were not only autonomous, but they had intention. So that, you, you know, when they were directed towards somewhere, then they suddenly switched into this mode, which says, ah, yes, I intend to attack this, target well that's an impossibly high uh uh bar to meet um for any weapon quite frankly but they've now changed their mind in our ministry of defense as far as i understand it and so we've got a common uh uh, uh definition um and but we still don't have a convention that governs the use of ai uh in weapons now i hope we will um and i think there are moves towards that and now we've got a better definition which is in common with many, many other countries now, mm -hmm. um, I think we might, we stand a chance of getting some sort of, of uh, agreement going, but it's hard going. I mean, you know, um, defense chiefs like new toys, you know, they like new, um, they like new weapons and, you know, uh, AI is the latest toy, you know, mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned, um, which is, which is quite worrying. Yes, I also, I also think so. Um, and what do you think about the consciousness in, in terms of AI? Like, let's, let's uh, philosoph, uh, like, um, let's imagine the, the, the gen, uh, like general AI um, gets so intelligent. What do you think the, the conscious mind of the machine, <laughs> uh, like, how, how should it be? Uh, regulated or how should should it be free like how should we um, interact with it 
Well, um, it's very interesting. A friend of mine, Professor Mike Waldridge, um, has written a book called The Road to Conscious Machines. Um, now, that road hasn't come to, a, come to an end yet because we ain't there. Um, but, you know, scientists, uh, particularly AI technicians, technologists, professors, ac academicians, you know, they love talking about, um, you know, whether these machines are conscious, whether they will ever be conscious, what is consciousness? You know, I'm just a humble politician. I, I look at the outcomes, the outputs, rather than the definition, basically, mm -hmm. um, because it's a bit, you know, uh, if, if you see it, you recognize what it's doing and you think, uh, yeah, that's a bit of machine learning or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to uh, risk assess accordingly. I think um, I'm not uh, great at, uh, you know, talking uh, in great seminars about definitions of these things, um, because I do think that we just have to uh, deal with what we're faced with at the current time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to be prepared, right? What, what can it be? Uh, that's <laughs> exactly the point that we made in our House of Lords yeah. report, and which people thought was the right, had the right balance between opportunity and risk, because mm -hmm. we can't take the opportunities unless we've mitigated the risks. And I hope but we've still, in public policy in the UK, got the balance right. And I, I'm sure that the EU is getting the balance right as well. And of course, you know, we're always concerned about whether a regulation is going to impact on innovation and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of my points is that quite often you can't get innovation unless there is enough of a framework to people feel comfortable mm -hmm. um, uh, about innovating and the standards under which they need to innovate. So regulation, setting of standards, sometimes can be very beneficial um, when you're innovating and you're encouraging uh, initiative and innovation. Yeah, correct, correct. Yes, yeah, like, like you said, um, come, going back to the, your other point on finding the, um, the, the alignment or like the, the balance between giving the freedom uh, of, of the industry to, to to innovate, but also making sure that they, <laughs> they, they know how they are designing it for, for the greater good, let's say. Um, but also the, the other point you made was about the alignment problem or like the control problem, right? Between, between the uh, risks and opportunities of, of the yeah. AI. So there is this uh, scenario, as you said, that the, there is this, um, there, there is a point where the super intelligent machine uh, gets away from us. So is it so <laughs> I, like you, you, you kind of said that there is no, uh, no, no need to worry at this point, but do you think we should be doing anything about it? Do we sh do, should we get more uh, like uh, we, sh we should m get more informed about potential risks? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a great believer in uh, making sure that we apply um, the precautionary principle. And the point is that, you know, that's the reason for looking at the risks now. That was the point I made earlier about AI being our servant, not our master. I mean, even now, we don't have artificial general intelligence, but we have narrow uh, AI, uh, which has many, many functions and uses and has quite a high degree of autonomy in certain cases. So what we need to do is to build the framework now, which is suitable for the future. That's the whole purpose of it. So what you don't do is just say, oh, AI is great. Well, apply that without any ethical framework, without any corporate uh, standards, corporate governance mm -hmm. standards, without any regulatory um, approach in terms of risk management and so on. We need to have all those in place so that when artificial intelligence does come, uh, 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 AGI, um, uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. comes down the track, that we're prepared for it. That's the whole purpose uh, really of what we do at this current moment because otherwise we will find ourselves not in the saddle but we will be driven um, by a, a technology um, that uh, we can't control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So do you think the autonomous AI can be used for good? Uh, you, you, yes, you said yes, <laughs> but then uh, what kind of examples you see or what kind of uh, use cases you you would 
imagine would be great to to focus on? Oh, I, I think um, if people really, really wanted to get ahead of the curve, they'd use it to solve some of the sustainable development goals, for instance, mm -hmm. conservation, the environment. I mean, the calibration of, uh, you know, uh, different aspects of the environment. I mean, I'm involved in um, uh, elephant conservation, for instance. Well, it, you know, AI has an enormous potential um, in, in cracking things like uh, poaching and uh, uh, the trade in uh, illegal wildlife uh, uh, products and so on. I mean, these, you know, AI has some incredibly beneficial uses. Um, the cracking poverty by, you know, the data an analytics involved. Mm -hmm. The many um, aspects of AI can help us solve the sustainable development goals. And I think if we highlighted what it can do in those respects, then I think people would. Uh, um, uh, not be a, as fearful as some of them are. I mean, you know, let's face it, there's a narrative here about AI, which is often very unhelpful. You know, people often uh, quote Elon Musk saying mm -hmm. that it's more dangerous than nuclear weapons. You know, uh, they sometimes quote uh, the late Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so it's either the best or the worst thing for humanity, for instance. You know, so there are, there are some narratives out there which are very um, uh, prevalent in people's minds. So I think, you know, establishing that these things can be highly beneficial, provided we mitigate the risks, then I think that's another powerful narrative that we must try and get across. Mm -hmm. Like you said, like giving the, the, the people the safety net or the comfort that they can safely innovate uh, and they can get some advice from, from the government uh, that will probably help with uh, like faster innovation. So yes. I'm conscious... And it's not a free-for-all, you know. It's yes. definitely not a free-for-all. Yes, you're right. So I'm conscious of the time. So the last question. <laughs> so where do you think the whole AI is heading? Uh, well, it's it's slow progress, actually, because I don't think corporates are yet fully on board. I think tech companies are. I mean, if you talk to people like Tech UK, um, who hosted a really uh, brilliant conference at the end of last year on ethics uh, and tech, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, you know, I think the tech industry, strangely enough, is really very on board. But I think that there is still great uncertainty about the hows of applying AI within mainstream business. You know, it's still seen as something for the chief technology officer or the uh, chief information officer. It isn't yet seen as a mainstream board issue. And I think that's one of the frustrations uh, because AI has so many different uh, possible use cases within business in terms of, you know, processes, in terms of customer service, in terms of supply chains, et cetera, et cetera, you know, uh, just the design of products. I mean, there are so many uses, uh, potential uses of AI and not just in financial services, which has been relatively quick in picking up um, the sort of fintech aspects. But, you know, there's an awful lot that can be used there. And uh, I think the business is still uncertain. They're worried about the costs um, of uh, implementing AI. They're worried about whether they have the skill sets internally um, to do these things. Um, and, you know, I suppose to some extent they might be worried about the regulations involved, but I think that's not nearly so prominent in their heads. So I think we need to keep um, uh, uh, advocating uh, the benefits while saying, uh, you know, these, this is the kind of framework that you need to adopt in order to apply it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like you said, we, we need to help those businesses um, join the conversation and maybe help uh, to translate between the technical, uh, quite geeky, sometimes seen as geeky, a uh, bit of, of the potential um, and opportunities of AI to, to the business people, how they can apply it into real uh, world cases. Precisely. And frankly, you know, it isn't rocket science. People can understand this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a lawyer, for God's sake. I'm not a technologist. But, you know, for the last two or three years, I've talked, you know, incessantly about AI, about, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 all these kinds of uh, uh, forms of machine learning, uh, mm -hmm. deep neural networks and so on and so forth. You know, and it's possible to sit there and be taught how all this works basically mm -hmm. and also to have an understanding of you know the kinds of practical 
uh, aspects in terms of explainability and so on, um, and black boxes. And, you know, I mean, it is possible to immerse oneself in this and actually understand uh, in a practical way. And that's what I think more people need to take the trouble to do, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are your like fav most fav like favorite uh, examples of uh, narrow AI uh, companies or, 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 or cases you, you saw? Well, let's face it. I mean, most people's favorite AI is the um, uh, is, is consumer oriented, isn't it? I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure there are lots and lots of different forms of uh, AI uh, out there in um, practice, um, you know, in education and health and so on. And I suppose in a sense, I would say that the best form of AI, it's where it's for, where it's for public benefit. But, you know, I love the fact that um, uh, I get recommendations for books, for films, for things like that in my everyday life, because, you know, I come across things that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily have come across, you know. Um, it, it, it enriches experience. So I think it's a mixture because we're all creatures um, who like um, personal attention, but we also want to see AI used for public benefit. So, you know, when I see that AI is beginning to identify, you know, different forms of cancer tumor um, to a much greater extent, then I think, wow, fantastic. When I see, you know, personalized education in action in AI, I think fantastic. You know, so I think it's a mixture of things, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for this. We 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 are done with all the questions. Well, when you when you next write to me, then um, we'll uh, we'll do that, Camilla. That's great. Thank you. Thanks so a much. lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Bye.